this point, all of you should know what this system is. This is my cloud gaming server, but it doesn't look like much of a server. And in the last video, I mentioned it was in need of an upgrade. I figure if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. Today's video is brought to you by Noom. Let's face it, the last year or two, it's been a little bit rough. And while I tend to eat fairly healthy, too much good food and good beer, well, they tend to stack on the pounds regardless of how good your metabolism is. Just like Raid is not a backup, Noom is not a diet plan. Instead of locking me down to foods that I can or can't eat, they focus on the psychology behind healthy living. Which is great because I don't want to necessarily cut out all of my carbs, eat nothing but chicken instead of steak, or let all of the barrel-aged stouts in my fridge keep right on aging. One of the other things I really like about Noom, actual human coaches. You're not just being held accountable by your smartwatch telling you to get up out of your chair at the least opportune time. Rather, Noom builds individual health plans based around who you are and what your lifestyle is, with actual fitness and nutrition experts helping you achieve your goals. Interested in taking Noom for a spin? Click the link down in the video description to get started and start working on your individual health goals today. Speaking of, I'm gonna get up and go for a walk. Not because my smartwatch tells me to get up out of my chair, but because I want to. And thanks again to Noom for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. As I mentioned in the intro, my cloud gaming server is in need of a bit of an upgrade to achieve my goal. That is having 12 headless gamers run off a single PC but the upgrades weren't in the areas that I expected. First off, you'd think that an Epic 7601 32 core 64 thread CPU would be more than up to the task of handling multiple virtual machines at the same time. And you'd be right, except for the fact that we're trying to run 12 gaming systems at the same time. Doing the math, if I have 64 threads and want to run 12 virtual machines, that means I have barely over two cores and four threads per VM. And I don't know if you knew this, but mainstream quad cores have been the norm for well over a decade. The second issue, believe it or not, was storage bandwidth. Even with a one terabyte NVMe Gen 3x4 drive as the boot drive and dual 1.92 terabyte SSDs running for game data, latency and storage bandwidth were still crippling load times in data heavy games. Now, while I could have just upgraded the CPU and installed some faster storage and called it a day, that leaves me with the issue of an Epic 7601 32 core CPU just sitting on my shelf collecting dust with no motherboard to put it in. And that's just not acceptable. So I might as well build myself a system that's twice as fast for more than twice as much. So today, I'm just going to be building a new cloud gaming server, starting with the biggest upgrade I have ever made in my entire life, the Epic 7742 CPU. 64 cores, 128 threads, running at a base clock of 2.25 gigahertz with a boost of 3.4, seven nanometer Zen 2 ROM architecture. This thing is insane. Not only can I now give each VM four cores and eight threads to work with, I have plenty of overhead left over for the hypervisor itself. Plus, I also have available cores left over for things like storage servers or even dedicated game servers, which means this will be a true all-in-one cloud gaming server. For storage, we are also taking a massive leap forward. In my hand are four Enterprise Gen 3x4 NVMe drives. Now, while I'm not sure the exact manufacturer of these drives, we'll probably figure that out once we plug them into the system. But what I can tell you is these are Fizon PS5007 controllers, 800 gigabytes of MLC NAND flash, and 512 megabytes of DDR3-2133 cache on board. These are equally as insane as that CPU right there. Now, while the read speed on each of these drives is a paltry 2600 megabytes per second, in fact, they're not even the fastest Gen 3x4 drives you can get, remember the latency and throughput of these are designed for data intensive server applications. So I'm sure having 12 virtual machines load gaming assets at the same time will be no sweat. Now, I couldn't afford an upgrade like this and still keep my family of five fed, even if the youngest doesn't eat very much yet. So huge thanks to Wendell over at Level 1 Techs for sending over the CPU and storage for this particular upgrade. Now, I didn't have a telecom rack to beam him over and my four post rack is completely full. Luckily, my portable rack is just the right size to fit an Epic CPU and four NVMe drives. Hopefully nothing got scrambled during transport. So that does it for the main upgrades, but what else is going into the system? 
Well, the old server already had 256 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC registered memory running at 2400. But I'm still going to be using that server for other things. So I picked up an additional 256 gigabytes of DDR4 ECC registered memory, this time at 2666. Of course, we have to have a motherboard to plug all this into. So I picked up an ASRock Rome 8D2T. This is a workstation motherboard with a single SP3 socket, supporting both AMD Epic Gen 2 and Gen 3 CPUs. It has eight DIMM slots for all eight channels of DDR4 memory, seven PCI Express X16 4.0 slots, dual M.2s and dual U.2s. Keeping the CPU cool will be the Noctua NHU12S, which was a fantastic cooler on the 7601, and I expect it to be equally as good on the 7742. And finally, keeping this thing fed with power will be the Be Quiet Dark Power Pro 12. This is a 1500 watt fully modular power supply. If this doesn't keep the CPU and graphics cards fed, nothing will. Now, for my cloud gaming server, I've been using the term server kind of loosely. While it is a server and it is headless, and they do make tower servers, I'm a rack-mounted guy through and through. Let's fix that. Oh yes, we are finally rack-mounting my cloud gaming server. Huge thanks to Inwin for sending over the RS400N for this project. This is a 4U server that should be an absolutely perfect match for this system. So, let's get this thing together. the system is now up and running. However, it wasn't without a couple minor hardships. Just don't look over here because the top isn't on the case. We'll talk about that one in just a minute. But there's a couple of things that they don't tell you when you're building AMD Epic systems for the first time, especially ones with such high core counts. First and foremost, it can take about three to four minutes to post for the first time. Now, once the system actually finished turning on in what felt like the longest four minutes of my life, remember, this is a $6,000 processor, uh, it was actually fairly smooth sailing getting Windows installed and getting everything up and running. Now, why don't I have any footage of me putting this into my server rack out in the garage? Well, there's a problem with the top case. Uh, it won't close because I'm an idiot. You see, on my last cloud gaming server with the Epic 7601, I was so happy with the Noctua NHU12S that I just bought another one without even considering the size constraints of a 120 millimeter cooler inside of a 4U chassis. And well, that ended up biting me pretty hard because while the cooler itself fits, the heat pipes stick out above the top of the chassis. And no, I'm not doing anything insane like cutting the top of the chassis open or bending the heat pipes down and recrimping them or anything crazy like that. No, I just ordered a 3U cooler and that'll be here in just a couple days. But why have you watched the video this far? That's right, you wanted to see a little bit of benchmarking. First and foremost, here is our Epic 7742 64 core processor. And I will say something that never gets old is going to the performance tab and looking at all of those threads. Uh, I'm just shy of needing a scroll bar uh, to see all of the active 128 threads on the CPU. It is really something to behold. In fact, in the default window view, I have a scroll bar and it just makes me giggle. 
And of course, we have all 256 of our DDR4s showing up. However, this is the older memory kit running at 2400. The reason being is the 2666 kit doesn't arrive till Tuesday. I just couldn't wait any longer to put this system together. And now, the really fun part. How fast will a 64-core Epic CPU run through Cinebench? Um, let's start with R15, because I want to see a bloodbath before I see some actual competition. And it looks like my previous high was on my Ryzen 9 5950X 16-core 32-thread CPU running at stock speeds, and that pulled in a 4369. That just barely edged out the 7601 for my previous cloud gaming server, which is a, again a 32-core system with a 4197. Now here's the deal with the AMD Epic 7742 versus the 7601 in my previous cloud gaming server. Remember, this is a full generational leap over the 7601. The 7601 was still on the original Zen 1 14 nanometer process, whereas the Epic Rome CPUs are based on 7 nanometer and Zen 2. So not only are they more energy efficient, they also have that full 15% IPC improvement that they boasted about two generations in a row. I just can't wait to get my hands on a Milan chip. And without further ado, let's just go ahead and hit that button and run the test. Uh, I don't think there's even going to be a need to time lapse this one. <clears throat> and it's done. <laughs> 8326. Uh, more than double the 32 core score, which is pretty much as expected. Let's run it again. takes almost as long to load the test as it does to actually run the damn thing. 8207. All right, with those fans ramping up, let's go ahead and just call that test right there. Uh, by the way, this CPU does spike up to 95 degrees pretty instantaneously when running AVX workload. So uh, definitely not something I want to do on the regular unless it is in the air conditioned server rack and the rear fans are on. I have them unplugged right now so I don't have to yell over the top of the server because, well, it is 11 o'clock at night. Now, one of the major downsides to the AMD 7601 was its single-threaded performance, scoring only a 126 in Cinebench R15. Now, I know that's not the be-all, end-all for gaming performance, but again, Cinebench R15 is a pretty good relative test when it comes to single-threaded performance. Unfortunately, a score of 126 kind of lands us in the bottom of the bell curve of Intel Sandy Bridge era chips. So they can still play modern games, but they're certainly not going to win any races, especially against modern CPUs. Now I will say I cheated slightly and I ran the single threaded test before I got on camera so I wouldn't have to run it live while recording 10 minutes of footage. Uh, and I scored a 153, which is a significant improvement over the 7601. In fact, a 153 lands us in competition with a Ryzen 1700X and a Ryzen 2600. Definitely not a bad place to be, considering we're aiming for 108060 gaming. And one last thing before I let you go, we're going to go ahead and run Cinebench R23, simply because I kind of want to see how quickly it'll slam through this one. Again, I'm not curious about if we're going to win, I'm curious by how much. And let's go ahead and turn off the minimum test duration instead of running a 10 minute stress test because, well, I'm positive this system would overheat and thermal throttle if I let it run for a full 10 minutes. Again, this cooler isn't designed to keep up with 225 to 250 watts, let alone when I don't have the server airflow going through it. But I think we can get one run out of it, so here we go. Wow. <laughs> oh my god. 54,716 points. Wow. That is insane. Straight up, that's insane. That ran R23 faster than some of my current systems run R15. I'm speechless. And jumping into hardware info, you can see why I didn't choose to run this for a full 10 minutes because, well, after about four seconds in AVX workload, we hit 92.2 degrees Celsius. So I'm happy to just kind of cut my losses and call this a win for the time being.
Now, when it comes to gaming performance, we're not going to be stressing the CPU that hard. AVX workload is one of the hardest things you can do to a CPU and generates the most amount of heat. In game, I think we're going to be just fine. And again, I'll be able to allocate a full four cores and eight threads to each virtualized gaming machine. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this one as much as I enjoyed building it. This was an absolute joy to work with this hardware for the first time. And watching those Cinebench numbers, I'm still kind of speechless. So thank you all for watching this one and a huge thank you to Wendell over at Level 1 Techs for sending out the 7742 and the four Intel P905 Optane drives that are now in my NVMe RAID. We'll get to that testing in a future video. As always, if you're interested in any of the hardware that I showed off today, follow the affiliate links down in the video description. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel, and who wouldn't, think about joining the Patreon or Floatplane. Links are also down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat directly with me, John, Rhett, Steve, and all the other hosts from Talking Heads. And that is going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today was sent over by longtime fan of the show, John Jay. This is from Treehouse Brewing up in Massachusetts. This is the Very Green Double IPA, 8.3%. Very Green is an original Treehouse Double IPA crafted with a carefully selected blend of Australian and American hops. It pours with a dense yellow body in the glass and forms a thick meringue-like head. It opens in the glass with huge notes of ripe pineapple, pithy citrus, and dank saturated hops. Ooh, I like the sound of that. As it warms, it shows its depth and complexity. Sweet bits of malt intermingle with straight Tropicana juice. It has a soft but pointed bitterness and rich velvety mouthfeel. This is the very best beer we can offer you. A true one of a kind. Enjoy. I will. Thank you. Boy, they were not lying about the meringue-like head. Hold on. Let me see if I can uh, do this right. How meringue-like is it? Not the stiffest head I've ever seen. Boy, even just the, the head on this one, I get where they're saying uh, ripe pineapple. That is delicious. Oh. Oh, that's good. Sorry, I, I wasn't thinking of the beer. I was just thinking I was thirsty and I took a drink and it really caught me off guard. <laughs> as much as this is very, very juicy, um, I was wanting just a little bit more pineapple sweetness. Like, don't get me wrong, it's a fantastic IPA. But when the first flavor note they mentioned, it opens in the glass with huge notes of ripe pineapple, pithy citrus, and dank saturated hops. If pineapple was their first and foremost thought, and I'm being overly critical on this beer, um, if pineapple was their very first thought, I'm having to dig for it more than I wanted. They don't mention the hops in this beer. I'm gonna guess Galaxy Mosaic as far as US-based hops. And then I'm not sure what they're doing for uh, the Australian hops. This is coming across as a phenomenal, slightly hazy double IPA with all of that rich, dank, uh, hop oil coating that you really want out of a Northwest style IPA, but with just a, like I said, just a dash of hazy from the East Coast. Um, this really is phenomenal. Uh, overcritical or not, it's still a great beer.